this is a page from a Norwegian newspaper uh, which shows that a man and a woman was sentenced had to pay 24,000 um, pounds for insurance fraud so we have equal opportunities in Norway so both women and men are involved uh, so this is an example of uh, insurance fraud uh, which is a huge problem in uh, most developed countries uh, this was an example of hard fraud so hard fraud that's deliberate uh, fraud uh, for example that you dump your car in uh, the nearest uh, lake or that you agree with your friend that you are arranging something related to your insurance policy but we are going to look at soft fraud soft fraud is a bigger problem maybe because it's much more common um, and soft fraud means that you for example uh, yeah, you have a legitimate claim but you maybe increase the amount or you have been traveling and lost your bag and then you said that I have 100 CDs or expensive uh, computer instead of a cheap computer and so on but th there can also be a fine line between hard fraud and soft fraud uh, and there can also be doubts whether it's soft fraud or just that you misunderstood what your policy covered for example so for the insurance companies it's not just about catching the bad guys but also uh, sort of uh, getting the correct uh, claims uh, a very co oh, I don't know common. I, this is uh, an estimate I heard from a Norwegian um, insurance fraud guy who said that the common uh, perception is that 10% of all claims are fraud. And this is quite a lot. It means that you could reduce your insurance bill by almost 10%. But this varies a lot between countries of course and I'm not going to mention which countries I think <laughs> are worst or best and between insurance types so maybe there's a higher degree of uh, soft fraud on travel insurance for example than on life insurance but no I mean nobody really knows um, except that the insurance companies of course investigate suspicious cases and that's what we are going to help them with um, we have a date oh, we have been cooperating with a major Nordic insurance company we are not allowed to say which one uh, and we have a data set of about 200,000 automobile claims about two years of data of these uh, about 5% were selected for control and these were selected based on a rule uh, based on a model that was not that good but anyway it was a consistent rule so think of it as a bad uh, or a too simple regression model and then out of these um, yeah, less than 5% were said to be soft fraud uh, and about 8,500 were cleared and then about 10% were not controlled and that could be because they didn't have the time some didn't have the manpower uh, yeah, not really related to the cases at all so this means that we treat these cases that are not controlled as missing at random so on the first level we have a sort of a, we have a consistent rule that clear these cases or say that these shouldn't be controlled which is the definition of missing at random and on the second level they are more or less missing completely at random we'll never know of course but uh, that's our assumptions and it's after discuss discussions with the insurance company we think this is a valid 
consumption. So we're going to study these cases, about 9,000 cases. Um, we are not allowed to go through all the covariates because this is sort of at the heart of the problem. But we are allowed to say something about groups of covariates. So uh, one third of the covariates are binary and two thirds are categorical or converted to categories. Like for example, age is a continuous variable but it's better to categorize it. So first we have nine covariates for claim and background. And I can be where you live or what, if you're man or woman or so on, demography. And then we have policy and vehicle. For example, if maybe if you drive a BMW or or this, yeah, you have an unusual policy combination or something like that. Then we have accident information. So where did the accident happen? When, for example, were you driving at night uh, and the driver was 20 years old? Maybe there's a higher risk. Um, and then we have claimant behavior. For example, did you change your policy around the accident time? Uh, I guess you can imagine some of the queries here. Um, as you see, we have quite a lot of covariates and we have quite a few soft fraud cases. So that means that we have to use some sort of dimension reduction. So it's not p much larger than n, but we need we cannot use all covariates or put equal weight on all covariates. Uh, so what we do is to estimate the probability of fraud given the covariates. And we have used 14 different models. Um, so I used one technique for machine learning called gradient boosted machines of regression trees. And then we have used a battery of sort of more or less standard uh, statistical techniques. So we have Lasso and Rich. I assume you are more or less familiar with this, which means that we Instead of ordinary logistic regression, we use all the covariates. We use some of them, or we use um, put less weight on each covariate, or something in between. And then we have principal components and yeah, Bayesian random effects. It's, it's all different uh, regression models. Um, what you get from these models is the probability of fraud. And that gives you a ranking, and that gives you, um, then you can say, I take today, I take the 10 or 100 cases with the highest probability and go through them and check them. Um, but you shouldn't just check the ones with the highest probability. If you have a claim with a very high claim amount and a bit lower probability of fraud, you should still check that claim. Uh, so we have, in addition to the covariates, we also have the claim amount. Uh, and we want to balance these, uh, the, the probability of fraud and, and the claim amount. And also have uh, an estimate of the internal, internal cost of investigating a case, for example. So anyway, for, this means that ranking is not enough and we need calibrated probabilities. Calibrated probabilities are probabilities that are true or more correct than uncalibrated probabilities. So in this case, we have fitted probabilities here. So fitted probabilities from any of the 14 models. And we have observed probabilities or observed frequencies here. And a perfectly calibrated model lies on this line. Uh, in addition, since we have 14 models, we have to combine them. Um, and we use many models because each model may have weaknesses and strength in different sort of different areas, it, and it's uh, shown 
both in theory and in practice that combining more many models is better than using just one model, especially for forecasting. Uh, what you see here is the simplest combination formula you can imagine, which is, which is called a linear pool. So it's just a linear combination of the 14 models. The problem with the linear pool is that it is shown that almost any non-trivial linear combination might, or there's a high risk that it's uncalibrated. So therefore, we uh, also use the beta linear pool, which is a linear combination here, but then transformed through the beta distribution. So we had to estimate these two parameters. Here's an example of uh, some of the fitted individual models. Um, it's maybe difficult to see here, but uh, here is one model, here is another, uh, yeah, and here are some of the more important models. So here I've written linear regression, but it means uh, uh, ordinary logistic regression. So log regression with all the covariates. Uh, and what you see with the, the standard technique is that we overfit. So we say that the probability is 20% when it's 5, for example. So for ranking, this is no problem, but for uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, management of uh, fraud cases, it's ho hopeless. Uh, but Many of the other models are better. They still overfit, but not to that extent. And some underfit down here. And remember that most of the cases are down here. I mean, it's not that common to have a probability of 20% of fraud. If you had that, it would be fairly simple to investigate these cases. Here we have combined uh, the 14 models with the linear pool and the beta linear pool. And you can see that the beta linear pool is better here. And the linear pool is maybe better here. Uh, but then again, most of the cases are here. So that's really what matters. So the beta linear pool should be the best candidate here. Um, what we did was that we uh, designed a cross-validation experiment where we started with, I think it was like six months of data, and then predicted the next month, added one month of data, predicted the next month, and so on. Um, and I'm not showing all the models here, there are too many. <coughs> here are, we have summarized the results in terms of the Breyer score. So the Breyer score is a number between zero and one. And the lower the better. And linear regression, which is, um, remember the logistic regression, is the, by far the worst model. You should expect this. Uh, and of course, we could have reduced the number of variables and so on. Uh, and then Lasso and Ridge are equally good. Uh, principal component analysis is this is the best of the principal component analysis model, models is slightly worse. Uh, the gradient boosting machine is the best individual model. The linear pool is slightly better and the better linear pool is slightly better but these three the three last here it yeah, doesn't really matter which one you use in terms of the Bryce score. In terms of AUC, area under the curve, it's the same story. So we get the same ranking, the same results, uh, and we get about up to 80% AUC, which is quite good. Um, and then we have um, combined the probabilities with the claim size and the internal cost. Uh, so that means that we compute the expected loss of each claim. Uh, and in terms of expected loss, the linear regression is just horrible. 
And that's because it's totally uncalibrated. So even though the ranking is okay. Um, The, um, the expected uh, loss is, uh, is terrible. Lasso and Rich are almost sim similar, and here Rich is the best individual model. Um, the GBM is slightly worse, and that's because it's less calibrated. The linear pool is actually worse than Rich regression, and that's also because it's not calibrated good enough, and especially in the area where we had, remember, where we had most of the cases. And then the beta linear pool uh, is the best model, since it's calibrated not perfectly, but better than the other ones. So to summarize, this is obviously important for society. If we can reduce the, I mean, suppose we catch half the soft fraud cases, or reduce this by half, it means that we could get 5% cheaper insurance. I suspect that we don't get 5% cheaper insurance, but maybe 3% or something like that. Um, and the, in addition to the cost, there's reputational costs, so there's more to this than just the, the cost. Uh, and I think this is even more important for each and one of us, especially when you think of this big data dilemma that uh, we are all investigated all the time. So first of all, cases are cleared more quickly, and we have less intrusion. So on one hand, uh, the insurance company get, get, companies gather huge amounts of data on us, but if they are not... Yeah, um, using them the wrong way, <laughs> they can use these data to 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 um, stop asking us silly questions. They don't have to call me and check if my uh, if something was wrong with my claim. But anyway, fewer cases. Here are a few references. Thank you. Just hang on a second for the mic. Uh, Jane Hutton, University of Warwick. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> in the UK, there's been quite a lot of concern in the motor industry about fake accidents and claims on whiplash. I was interested in the types of um, insurance that are most vulnerable. Yes, I um, don't think I'm allowed to say that, but... Uh, I suspect that, no, no. I'm not sure if whiplash has been an issue in the Nordic countries, maybe many years ago, but it's, I, I don't have the feeling that that's an issue now. Um, yeah, that's my... <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Well, in your data, did you look to see what features had the most explanatory power? I mean, yes. Um, so what? You know. I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I will say, uh, or what we are going to investigate, is the groups. So which groups have the most explanatory power? Because that we are allowed to say that, but not which variable. Uh, but uh, it's not. I mean, I think you can imagine which variables are. So, so which groups did have the most experience? Uh, we, we don't know yet because we haven't uh, had time to look into it. No. I think you must have said this, but I missed it. What was your gold standard for deciding how good your methods were at um, detecting the cases of fraud? Uh, this is a very good question. <laughs> uh, the problem is that we don't really have a gold standard, because the gold standard is this rule here. I mean, 
and that's it's obvious that this rule is bad, but it's very difficult for us to say how bad it is without having any of these cases. So what we want insurance companies to do is to say, oh, today we investigate 50 cases. One or two of these should be a random sample. But this is a hard, <laughs> it's not easy to make them start doing this and you cannot do too much of this either because it's uh, very annoying for the investigators to get cases that are obviously not fraud. But they did reinvestigate yeah, yeah, what we have done for example is to say uh, we ran your model on all of these cases. Here's a list of the 20 most uh, suspicious cases and then they said oh yes they are all suspicious. But I mean this is a very difficult question since we have the censoring. Mm. Jason, I think this has got to be the last question because then there's the plenary session in the overall. Uh, sorry, what I've dealt with large numbers of covariates, I've tried, often tried within groups to see whether the information is simply repeating. Um, so, for example, with brain tumours, there were <coughs> maybe 20 binary covariates measuring various things, but when you actually looked at them, there, you know, there were complete dependencies, so you could actually reduce your numbers quite simply. Yeah. Have you look, you've done that, yeah. Yeah, we can see that more or less. And, and that's what these, uh, these dimension reduction models do, essentially. They don't really care which variable matters, but it's the sort of the sum of these or a few of these. That's why Lasso and Rich is all, have all the same. Yeah. I would just use it to reduce the data collected rather than... Oh, yes, but the data collected are collected anyway. Yes, these are huge. I mean, the insurance companies are huge data collecting machines. So, and it could be that in car, uh, for example, in automobile insurance, some queries are not important, but they are very important in travel insurance. Or, uh, and you can also imagine, yeah, looking at several insurance uh, types at the same time, for example. <laughs>